Should the state enforce sterilization among criminals? Should the state incentivize sterilization? At what point does that become a eugenic program? And how desirable is this? And perhaps the most important question, how efficient is this? A judge in White County, Tennessee thinks he has it all figured it out, but does he? Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so this is a rather bizarre story, but it's a good case to use in order to bounce around policy ideas. I mean, after all, at a not so distant point in time, those of us on the non-left will have to be the main drivers of policy anyway, especially after the next narrative is settled. So take this video as an intellectual exercise first and foremost, although we will dwell a bit on the specifics of the case. Uh, coming from News Channel 5, white county inmates given reduced jail time if they get vasectomy. Now I chose this source because it has the least amount of partisanship involved in its reporting. Anyway, it goes like this, quote, Inmates at in White County, Tennessee have been given credit for their jail time if they voluntarily agree to have a vasectomy or birth control implant, a popular new program that is being called unconstitutional by the ACLU. On May 15, 2017, General Sessions Judge Sam, uh, uh, Sam Benningfield signed a standing order that allows inmates to receive 30 days credit towards jail time if they undergo a birth control procedure. Women who volunteer to participate in the program are given a free Nexplanon implant in their arm. The implant helps prevent pregnancies for up to four years. Men who volunteer to participate are given a vasectomy free of charge by the, the Tennessee Department of Health. County officials said that since the program began few, uh, a few months ago, 32 women have gotten the next plan on implant and 38 men were waiting to have the vasectomy procedure performed. Judge Benningfield told News Channel 5 that he was trying to break a vicious circle of repeat offenders who constantly come into his courtroom on drug-related charges, subsequently can't afford child support and have trouble finding jobs. I hope to encourage them to take personal responsibility and give them a chance when they do get out to not to be burdened with children. Get an editor, Channel 5. This gives them a chance to get on their feet and make something of themselves, Judge Benningfield said in an interview. First elected in 1998, Judge Benningfield decided to implement the program after speaking with officials at the Tennessee Department of Health. I understand it won't be entirely successful, but if you reach two or three people, maybe that's two or three kids not being born under the influence of drugs. I see it as a win-win, he added. Inmates in the White County Jail were also given two days credit towards their jail sentence if they complete a State of Tennessee Department of Health Neonatal Syndrome Education program. The class aimed to educate those who are incarcerated about the dangers of having children while under the influence of drugs. Hopefully, while they're staying here, we rehabilitate them so they never come back, the judge said. District Attorney Brian Dunaway, who oversees prosecution of cases in White County, is worried the program may be unethical and possibly illegal. It's concerning to me. My office doesn't support this order, Dunaway said. It's comprehensible that an 18-year-old gets this done, it can't get reversed, and then the imp that impacts the rest of their life, he added. On Wednesday, the ACLU released this statement on the program, quote, offering a so-called choice between jail time and coerced contraception or sterilization is unconstitutional. Such a choice violates the fundamental constitutional right to reproductive autonomy and bodily integrity by interfering with the intimate decision of whether and when to have a child, imposing an intrusive medical procedure on individuals who are not in a position to reject it. Judges play an important role in our community overseeing individuals' childbearing capacity should not be part of that role. Uh, 
it's funny to see ACLU uh, arguing for less bro fewer roles for government authorities. But anyway, first things first, the ACLU is wrong. At best, the ACLU doesn't know whether the program is constitutional or not because it hasn't been tested in court. So at best, they're naively assuming. At worst, the ACLU is being deliberately misleading and purposefully concealing the 1927 ruling in Buck v. Bell, in which after an 8-1 to decision, the court upheld the statute in the Commonwealth of Virginia, instituting compulsory sterilization of the unfit for the protection and health of the state. And that decision was never expressly overturned. So, for all intents and purposes, the program is constitutional at this very moment. Whether it should be constitutional or not, or whether the Supreme Court would still uphold it today, 90 years after Buck versus Bell, now that is a separate and also open question. The ACLU is of course free to speculate on that, but to outright say it is unconstitutional is, I'm afraid to say, a lie. But then again, we're all accustomed to the ACLU lying, so it's not like it's the first time, nor the last time. Secondly, it is noteworthy that the judge doesn't think in ideological terms at all. That, I mean, come on, this is a small community. This judge hears almost all of the cases in that community. Divorce, juvenile, petty theft, parking fines, you name it. So his opinion comes from what he has personally seen within his own community, and he sees this as a decent trade-off. Thirdly, it is also noteworthy that the judge thinks like a doctor and not like a researcher. Now, for those unfamiliar with the metaphor, the doctor counts his successes in how many patients he saves and sees a failure in every patient he fails to save, whereas a researcher looks at a broader picture. So if a, in pursuit of a cure, 10,000 people will likely die, but then 1 million are saved, the researcher deems that to be okay. Whereas for the doctor, if he says, saves 5 people but also loses 10, he will will count the five as small victories and a success per se. And this is how this judge thinks as well. He acknowledges outright that the program may not be universally efficient or successful, but if you just reach those two or three people, that's already a win, he says almost in these exact words. Now this is relevant for all those who went straight to the cries of fascism and whatnot. That's not how it works. Not for this judge, anyway. He's not making claims that uh, this can work for everyone, but he's just saying that it could be a useful ter uh, tool to curb recidivism in his own community. Now, whether he has a point or not is up for discussion. For instance, uh, White County, Tennessee has a population of 27,000 people, give or take. The median age in the area is 41.6, and its crime stats are way below average. The total crime risk is 72% of the national average, so basically it's a relatively quiet, mostly old county. Hardly the place where such a harsh measure would be appropriate. Although, admittedly, the county has a relatively high divorce rate, with more than 10% of the populace being divorced or separated. That's quite high, but still. Now, I haven't been able to find conclusive evidence that there's been a significant rise of children born with various syndromes associated with substance abuse or drugs. Reports claim that there has been a rise. Okay, but how high? I mean, 10 cases instead of 5? I mean, yeah, that's a 100% increase, but it's still just 5 extra cases, not a serious crisis. But for the purposes of this analysis, let's assume for a moment the judge has a point with this. Let's trust his judgment that babies born or conceived under the influence of drugs is a serious issue in White County. So, I mean, how will the problem be mitigated, considering that you don't permanently sterilize the women, even though they're half of the problem? Also, what kind of drugs and what amounts we're talking about? Because there is a case to be made that some of these people are not exactly criminals to begin with. Now, whilst I'm not a fan 
uh, or, or at least not exactly a fan of legalizing all drugs, one also needs to take into account that the scare of babies being born defective as a result of drugs has also been blown out of proportion, and Judge Benningfield is at the right age to have been influenced by the huge scare campaign that ran in late uh, 1980s and early 1990s. The point that I'm trying to make here is that there isn't much to justify this. Even if you want to offer a charitable interpretation to all of this and you're not into the uh, ACLU bandwagon of perpetual whining. Yes, the ACLU is wrong when it claims this is not constitutional, but that doesn't make this program necessarily right or useful. But on a more broader point, having looked at the specifics of the case, the question of principle still does remain. And here I'll offer my take on it and, of course, feel free to argue and disagree in the comments. On the first question, whether the state should enforce sterilization among criminals, the judge defends himself saying the program is voluntary. Well, maybe, but it's also under duress. I mean, it would be illegal if I were to kidnap someone and tell them that I'll keep them for three months in my basement because they stepped on my lawn. But if they agree to sterilize themselves, I'll only keep them for just two months in my basement. In addition to the kidnapping charge, no court would dismiss the grievous bodily harm charge just because I said the prisoner agreed voluntarily to this and I kept my word and released the prisoner earlier and also paid for the sterilization. This defense would never fly in any court. So it is thus plainly obvious to me that this voluntary scheme is... A is not that voluntary at all, and very much a consent given under duress. But here comes the second question, on whether the state should incentivize sterilization, and here the issue is much murkier than it would seem at the first glance. What this program in Tennessee does is not in incentivization, since, as we established, it is under duress. However, there have been cases in recent history of states actually doing that. India, for instance, still has such a program to this very day. Now, admittedly, it started in 1976. When it started, the program included forced sterilization, as in literally agents of the government would come into private homes and pick up people and whisker them away to a hospital to have them sterilized. But things have evolved since then. In the current year, the program uses a mixture of propaganda and monetary and other material incentives to convince people to get sterilized. The government still maintains to this day the so-called sterilization camps, although last year they were older, ordered by the High Court to shut them down in the next three years. Anyway, Another example is Slovakia. Now, when one mentions Slovakia in this context, most people think of the scandal of, that broke 15 years ago when supposedly some doctors performed forced sterilization on some gypsy women. But that's old news. Much more recently, last time in 2014, the state pays people to get sterilized. Leftist groups claim it's, it's targeting gypsies, though no evidence of that has been uncovered yet. The common feature of all of these examples, and many others, these are not the only two examples, especially the examples coming from non-totalitarian countries, is that whether the, whenever the government tries to do it, it kind of tends to fail miserably. It's just not efficient. Okay. But this still leaves the most important question. How desirable is such a program? And the answer, again, is not so simple. There is a case to be made that some people shouldn't reproduce. The disagreement is on how to define those people. Because there are no obvious cases, especially when you, uh, when you talk about large groups. And then there is the implementation program, pro problem. The government is inefficient and prone to horrible abuses. The private sector, however, appears to be more successful. The project prevention in California is, for instance, a large enterprise of paying drug addicts to get sterilized. And no, I'm not joking. Founded in 1997, Project Prevention now operates in the United States and the United Kingdom and is considering expanding to Ireland. Their, their activity is <clears throat> pretty straightforward. 
prove that you're an addict and will pay for your sterilization and give you some extra uh, pocket cash as well, roughly $300. Uh, dollars. And this model seems to be holding uh, the key to finding some balance. If you believe addicts should be sterilized, donating to project prevention looks to be uh, a far better way to make sure this actually happens than passing a law uh, or a judicial standing order. Because in the end, only the private sector can make sure everything is fully voluntary. The state cannot. And admitting that should be a priority. So this leaves us with the moral question. Is it moral to have eugenic goals in mind? And quite frankly, I don't know the answer to that. Admittedly, I never cared enough about that to begin with. It's rather an issue of means than of purpose to me. Voluntary negative eugenics, which is exactly what project prevention is doing, doesn't sound all that bad. And if it's been operating for 20 years in hyper-leftist, lawsuit-happy California, then it's probably good enough no matter what stance one takes on it. If ACLU in California couldn't shut them down, then they're probably as neutral and as honest as anything can get. More broadly, I'm more concerned with the means of achieving it, as I already said, but also with the criteria. And while this sounds awful to say, it's actually mainstream opinion amongst doctors. There is a reason healthy young adults can't get legally sterilized so easily. Most doctors refuse, while more middle-aged or otherwise physically sick people are much more likely to find a willing doctor should they seek sterilization. Strictly on um, eugenic goals per se, I think they're rather a distraction, a collectivist one at that. And the reason I'm saying this is because proper traditional societies already tend to have eugenic results, even without giving a toss about the topic to begin with, and more importantly, leaving room for difference as well. And this is what I generally prefer. prefer. When you don't have perverse incentives offered by the state, such as the gigantic welfare state that destroys families and communities and arguably promotes dysgenic results, the outcome will be roughly similar without the need to coerce or pay anyone into sterilization. Focusing on sterilization and eugenics strikes me as uh, short-sighted and also with a whiff of utopian thinking. Predicated on a notion that no amount of evil can be tolerated, but that's simply absurd. There are no solutions, only trade-offs, so you have to tolerate a certain amount of evil. And by cutting down socialism, a lot of the evil gets, uh, well, disincentivized. When you don't have a huge welfare state, you also don't have too many drug addicts with 12 children. Case in point, the countries of the Intermarium. Every strong drug that you find in Europe has to come through here. Well, actually, two-thirds of them, the other third comes from Morocco. But almost all of them have to go through here, because they're, most of them are manufactured either in Afghanistan or in Russia. So they have to go through here on their way to Western Europe. Buying drugs is not an issue in the Intermarium. It's cheap and always available. And it's not cheap just in absolute terms, but in relative terms as well. I mean, I can get more doses of heroin with a median Polish or Romanian wage than with a median German wage. Yeah, that cheap. Yet for some reason, there is no epidemic of junkies having 12 children. It could be because junkies here know full well that the state won't raise their children for them. I mean, it could be. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a dude with a camera in a working class apartment. <laughs> so, uh, what do you guys think? Does the judge have a point? Would such programs be efficient? Please do tell me in the comments. Let's um, bounce this idea around and see what comes out of it. And with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your continuous and generous support. And um, I'll see you all very soon on Freedom Alternative.